Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us on today's webinar, Making the Most of Your Measurement, Flow Best Practices. My name is Allison Sterling and I'm a Marketing Manager with Emerson Micromotion and I'm pleased to welcome you to the Emerson Flow Expert webinar series. Before we begin today, I just want to take a brief moment to acquaint you with your webinar. Our environment. On your screen, you should see a presentation window on the left side, a Q&A chat window in the upper right-hand corner, media player controls, and a resource box with related content that you can view and download during the event. You can resize, move, or minimize any of these windows during the event to fit your viewing preferences. So, for example, if you'd like to view the actual slides, um, just the slides during the event, you can maximize that to your screen size. At the bottom of your display, you should see a row of icons that give you some added capabilities, such as you can share this webinar via social media channels, or you can request a visit from one of our full experts. Throughout our presentation, we encourage you to interact with our speaker by typing in questions and comments using the chat panel. We'll be holding questions to the end of the webinar, and we'll be answering questions at that point. If for whatever reason we don't get to all the questions, don't worry, our speaker will follow up with you after the webinar. We are also recording today's session, and we will make the link to this recording available to you 24 hours post-event via email. We will also be sharing with you all of the resources that are available um, in your presentation console um, in that same email. On today's webinar, we are lucky enough to have joining us Tanya Wyatt, our Global Chemical Industry Marketing Manager for Micromotion. Tanya Wyatt is our, as I mentioned, is our Global Industry Marketing Manager, and she holds a bachelor's degree in chemical and petroleum refining engineering from the Colorado School of Mines with a minor in environmental science and engineering. She's been at with Emerson over 15 years in a variety of roles, including new product development, product marketing, and industry marketing. Prior to joining Emerson, Tanya worked at a chemical company in Texas doing R&D related to polymers. Welcome, Tanya. Thank you, Allison. Um, good day, everyone, and thank you for joining. And I, before we get started, I really just want to say a quick thank you to a couple of my colleagues who provided a lot of great content to help with this presentation, and it really wouldn't have been possible without them. So first of all is Parker Seaton. He's a flow specialist, and he has lots of experience with all kinds of flow technology, and he was truly instrumental in this process. And then I'd also like to thank Ryan Bolds for his input on the vortex meters and Shelby Traverso for her help on differential pressure meters. And with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So today we're going to talk about flow metering best practices. And we're going to talk about choosing the appropriate technology and properly sizing it. And then once you've picked your flow meter, installing and using it properly can help you optimize your measurement. As part of operational best practices, we'll also talk about considerations for maintenance, and pressure drop and getting access to really valuable diagnostic information for your meters. Be aware in the time that we have available, this is just going to be an overview, but if you want any more in-depth discussions, you're always welcome to click on the Contact Us button and one of our flow consultants can help you with your specific applications. So did you know that 75% of flow meters in use in industry today aren't performing satisfactorily? And that improper selection counts, accounts for 90% of these problems, according to Omega and Control Engineering? You know, no wonder this is such a popular topic. Installation can be an issue as well. In fact, there were three orifice runs where the plates were installed off-center, and it resulted in $10 million in compensation according to a paper that was presented at the North Sea workshop by the National Engineering Lab. And to top it off, the people who knew and understood all the unwritten rules around installing and using these flow meters are retiring. More than 50% of the experienced workforce will be retiring over the next 10 years. So today I'm just going to try to share with you some of these tips and best practices. Flow measurement best practices can dramatically improve performance and eliminate some potential issues that you might have with measurement. There are multiple aspects to optimizing the performance from the initial sizing and selection of the flow technology to utilizing advanced diagnostics 
and considering remote access to those diagnostics. We're going to start with sizing and selecting the appropriate flow technology, and then we'll move through the rest of these topics as we continue on the webinar. So when you're selecting the proper flow technology, there truly is no one-size-fits-all for your solution. Um, each application is unique, it's different, each situation should really be assessed carefully. And whether you're trying to measure fluid to improve process control, needing custody transfer performance, if you're measuring utilities or improving process efficiency, you'll want to consider not just the purchase price of the meter, but the total cost of ownership from purchase to installation, maintenance, upgrades, services, repairs, training, and more. The first consideration is going to be the process fluid and the properties of that fluid. Some fluids are really going to be easy to measure, like water, while others present more challenges like high viscosity fluids or high vapor pressure liquids. We're going to talk in more detail here in a minute on some of the challenging fluid properties that you're going to run across. It's important to consider the performance that will be needed for the application, like is accuracy super important? or is repeatability more important? How large of a turndown are you going to require for the application? Are there other performance parameters you might need to consider for the application like environmental effects, temperature effects, that sort of thing? What line size will be used? Does the meter need to be drainable? Is plugging a possibility? Do you have enough room for the sufficient straight runs? Um, and of course, there are economic factors to consider. If the measurement is critical to the process, then cost may not be much of a consideration. Long-term stability and reliability might be the important considerations here. It's also important to consider how much installation is going to cost, both in terms of materials and the engineering costs. Plus, don't forget about the ongoing maintenance costs, especially for mechanical meters with moving parts that can wear over time. Also consider, are there any environmental or safety considerations for your application? Once you've thought about all of this information, then you can choose a particular flow meter. Emerson has a meter technology selection tool that's coming very soon on our website, but in the meantime, if you want to help, if you want help picking out the best technology, you can visit with one of our flow consultants or fill out the contact me form on the webinar console and we can help you to consider the advantages and limitations of each technology with your particular application in mind. After selecting the technology, you can use our sizing tool available on our online store. And I did put a link to the online store on the console and a video that shows you how to use the sizing tool. So we're not going to get into how to use the sizing tool here today but there is a link to that on, on the console. So first I'd like to go over some of the challenging fluids that you might encounter and give you some tips for dealing with these particular fluids. We'll talk about gases, dense phase fluids or supercritical fluids, you might hear them referred to in both ways, um, steam and high vapor pressure liquids. As most of you know, the reason gas is trickier to measure than liquids is that they're compressible, so changes in pressure and temperature can significantly change the density of the gas. So if you think about it, the same amount of gas sealed in a balloon or a tire, for example, can occupy a different volume depending on the pressure and temperature. If your temperature increases, the volume increases because the density of the gas decreases. Conversely, as the pressure increases, the density also increases, and then the volume occupied by the gas decreases. Here on this slide, you can see a pipeline transporting gas molecules. As you can see, as pressure and temperature change, the gas density and volume in the pipeline also changes. So if you're talking about an actual cubic foot or an actual cubic meter, it doesn't always mean that you're talking about the same number of gas molecules. And for that reason, um, that's why gases are typically either measured in standard volume or mass flow units. So this is a table of some of the most common standard or reference flow rates along with their associated reference temperatures and pressures. As a tip for sizing flow meters, 
make sure you're using the appropriate flow units and the reference temperature and pressure match your plant standard. Even though we call them standard units, um, the reference temperature and pressure can vary, and they do vary, from industry to industry and by location. It's not uncommon for us to see people trying to size a meter using actual cubic feet when they meant to use standard cubic feet. And that can result in completely the wrong meter size, especially if you're talking about like a high pressure gas. Another thing to consider when you're sizing a meter for a gas application is that turndown can vary significantly depending on the conditions of the gas. For a Coriolis meter, for example, the rangeability for the application is going to be highly dependent on the meter design and the operating pressure. So this graph shows some different meter designs, and the Micromotion Elite meters that have the most turndown capability are going to be those curves near the top that, that have higher turndown as you go up to higher pressure. Um, while some designs inherently offer higher turndown capabilities, regardless of what Coriolis meter you choose, every meter is going to have more rangeability if you have increased pressure for gas applications. So if you are planning to install a Coriolis meter in a gas application and you have a choice about where to locate the meter, if you have the choice of locating it upstream of a regulator or at a higher pressure location, you're going to have more rangeability on the meter by doing this. So when rangeability is important, um, make sure you choose a design that's going to allow you to have maximum turndown like the Micromotion Elite meter. And then Note that this pressure relationship isn't true for all technologies. An ultrasonic meter, for example, works across a velocity range, such as one foot per second to 100 feet per second, so the rangeability isn't affected by the density of the gas. Even at low pressures, the ultrasonic meter can still measure the full range of velocities. The next challenging fluid that I'd like to discuss is supercritical or dense phase fluid. When fluid is in the supercritical phase, compressibility is even more significant. And this means that even small changes in temperature and pressure can result in very large changes in density. And for this reason, it's really important to make sure that you're aware of the process conditions, including the density of the fluid, even when you're sizing and selecting the meter. Many supercritical fluids are bought and sold in mass units but they're sometimes measured in volumetric units, so getting a really good density reading or making careful compensation based on temperature and pressure is really important to get to the correct mass units. You can also measure mass directly with the technology and then you don't have to worry about that conversion. Some of the most common fluids that are transported in the supercritical phase are carbon dioxide, ethylene, methane, and ethane. A supercritical fluid is any substance where the temperature and the pressure are above its critical point, and there is no distinguishable phase change between gas and liquid. It's kind of tricky to think about this kind of fluid, but the fluid properties are typically between those of a gas and a liquid, and a supercritical fluid has no surface tension. They have densities that are going to be similar to liquids, but mobility is going to be similar to gases. So they're going to have very low viscosities and intermediate diffusivity. On this diagram, you can see where above a temperature of about 304 Kelvin, carbon dioxide will not make a transition from gas to liquid, no matter how high you increase the pressure. So as I mentioned before, the density of the supercritical fluid is highly dependent on its pressure and temperature, and you can get really accurate density information by using the NIST webbook properties available on the web, and I've shown the link here. When you get to their site, you simply just choose the fluid, choose your units, enter the operating conditions, and you can get fluid property results. These numbers are really helpful when you're sizing a meter, and they can also be helpful for troubleshooting purposes during operation as well. So I use this website all the time, and I definitely think it's worth going to. Steam is another very common fluid. 
um, but can represent some flow measurement challenges. Steam is often found as either superheated steam or saturated steam. If you know either the temperature or the pressure of the saturated steam, you can determine the other parameter because it is at equilibrium. And you can use steam tables to look up the fluid properties, like the density. You can easily use a velocity-based flow meter with temperature measurement to get to a mass flow rate for saturated steam. For example, a vortex meter with temperature compensation may be a good choice for measuring saturated steam. And because saturated steam is right at that equilibrium point, there can be some condensate coming out of the steam as it's transported. A good practice, and I'm sure most of you are doing this, is just to make sure that you're using steam traps to rid the system of any condensate, which will ensure that you're delivering dry steam to the process. And this will also make the flow measurement more accurate with single phase flow. Steam traps can get pro be problematic though, and they can get stuck closed, meaning you have like a cold steam trap that's no longer working, or they can get stuck open and leak valuable energy or heat from the system. I'm not planning to talk about steam traps a lot here, but I do want to mention that Rosemount offers an acoustic steam trap monitor that can detect if you have problematic steam traps, and it can provide up to about 20% fuel cost reduction. So if you're interested in information about this, it's called the Rosemount Wireless Acoustic Transmitter, and you're welcome to contact us about that as well. Superheated steam is always going to be dry by definition. Um, a big challenge for superheated steam is that it typically has very high temperatures, and if you're going to convert it to mass flow from a velocity-based measurement or volume measurement, um, you need to measure both pressure and temperature. So for steam applications, the best practice is to use a compensated DP flow meter or a vortex meter. Some steam applications are dirty, like in a hydrocarbon cracking furnace, where you have some recycled steam that may have coke particles in it. Um, in that case, you probably want to avoid using impulse lines that could plug, and a vortex meter is a really excellent choice for that application. Just be careful because not all vortex meters are the same, and specifically the Rosemount Model 8800 meter is a really good choice for this because there are no crevices to plug and no gaskets to fail, potentially causing steam leaks. And on your dashboard, you're going to see there's a success story about Shell using vortex meters for steam measurement in one of these cracking furnace applications. So feel free to download it for more information. The final challenging fluid that we're going to talk about today are high vapor pressure liquids. The biggest thing to mention here is that high vapor pressure liquids are often transported using their own vapor pressure right at the phase transition point. This isn't always the case, but it is important to understand how close you are to that boiling point just to make sure you don't have flashing in the meter as you encounter pressure drop through the system. It's important to keep in mind that a sizing program will tell you the permanent pressure loss in a meter, but typically doesn't give you the whole picture. So think about an orifice plate. As the flow passes through the narrow opening of the plate, the area is significantly decreased, so the velocity of the gas has to go up to go through the plate before the cross-sectional area increases again, which slows the gas back down. When the pipe area decreases, some of the pressure, the potential energy, has to be converted into kinetic energy and reduces the pressure in the system. As the fluid slows down again, that kinetic energy converts back to pressure and theoretically, none of the pressure would be lost. Of course, there are other sources of pressure loss, like friction, that do cause a permanent loss. So the graph on the top shows the pressure going into the orifice, and then the differential pressure across the plate, and the pressure as part of it is recovered. And then finally, on the far right, you'll see the new pressure after the temporary drop is recovered. So this happens with other flow meters as well. For example, a Coriolis meter typically has smaller tubes than the piping, and the fluid is accelerated through the measuring tubes and decelerated at the exit. 
A typical sizing program is just going to show you that permanent pressure loss and you won't have an indication of that recoverable pressure drop. So this slide shows the pressure profile as the fluid flows from the inlet pipe through the sensor and out the outlet side. As you can see, the red line here shows the pressure drop through the sensor, but part of that drop is recovered. As long as the pressure drop inside the meter stays above the vapor pressure of the liquid, which is shown on the green line, there are no issues, so that's the case in this particular picture. However, if you have a high vapor pressure fluid that you're transporting, such as propane or ammonia, especially if it's being stored at or near the vapor pressure, the liquid could experience flashing and cavitation, and this will add to uncertainty of the measurement and really should be avoided. Emerson takes a look at this and actually uses the vapor pressure of the liquid to determine if the minimum pressure in the sensor is going to fall below the vapor pressure and will warn you if you need to use a different size meter if that's the case. So outside of these more challenging fluids, here are just some general guidelines around which flow technologies will fit your fluid. While most technologies are going to work just fine for clean fluids, Certain technologies like Coriolis, Vortex, PD, and MAG meters are going to work best for your slurry type applications. And then ultrasonic, turbine, and vortex meters tend to work better with fairly low viscosity fluids, while Coriolis meters are going to work well with all ranges of viscosity. So this is just a little summary table. Again, if you need more help with this, we would love to consult with you on your particular application. So on the previous slide, I mentioned viscosity, and speaking of viscosity, even when you're measuring flow, keep in mind that there are other operating parameters that may be important depending on the application. For example, if you're doing blending and quality control applications, concentration is probably going to be a very valuable measurement. The phase of the fluid can also be important when you're looking to protect equipment and density and or viscosity are often used if you're trying to do interface detection. So depending on your application, other variables may be important to look at besides just flow. We've gone through quite a bit of information, so I'd like to take just a short pause, make sure everybody's still with me here, and ask you to share with us what types of meters you're currently using for a basic process control application. Um, medium accuracy, nothing super exotic. And we have a list of technologies that you can select and we'll take a look at the results here in a minute. We have some answers coming in, but it looks like a few more of you still need to vote, so I'll give you another couple of seconds here. Okay, the results are in, and it looks like a lot of you are using DP flow meters, which is not surprising. That's um, definitely one of the most popular technologies out there and has been around for a long time. Looks like some of you are using mag meters, Coriolis, and Vortex as well, so that's good. Um, really just trying to take an assessment and see what's being used out there today. Now let me ask you one more question. If you have critical measurements like custody transfer, does that change which meter type you're currently using? So go ahead and answer this again for high um, demand applications like custody transfer. Give you a couple more seconds here to vote.
Okay, and let's look at the results. It looks like the vast majority of you are actually using Coriolis meters when you're doing custody transfer. Um, I'm surprised there aren't more turbine meters, um, just because those have been around for quite a while and have traditionally been used some for custody transfer, but definitely some DP meters and a little bit of other technologies as well. So, good. Um, so let's move beyond picking the flow technology just a little bit and talk about quantifying and optimizing the installed performance of the meter. So we'll start by talking a little bit about accuracy and repeatability. So I'm sure you're probably already aware of the difference, but just as a refresher, accuracy is the extent to which a given measurement actually agrees with the value of the measured quantity. It's very important consideration and really can impact quality of materials produced and billing for products and process efficiency. Repeatability is the ability of the flow meter to produce that same measurement each time it measures a flow. For making consistent, high-quality products, sometimes the repeatability over time is more important than the absolute accuracy of the device. For example, if you're batching something and you know what recipe makes a good batch, um, it may not matter so much exactly how much of a component you're using as long as you can repeat that same batch every single time and get kind of your golden batch, so to speak. In order to meet the quality specification for a product, um, you have a set point for the parameter that you establish, and you want that set point to ensure that you're going to meet the minimum specification every time so that you don't have to scrap or rework the product. However, the more you overshoot to exceed that minimum specification, the more value you're adding without getting additional benefit. So this may come at the cost of excess energy or feedstock. There's always some uncertainty associated with the measurement, so by default, there's a gap between the specification and the set point. As you reduce the uncertainty of the measurement, you will reduce the potential variability around the set point. You're now going to have a wider gap between the set point and the product specification. which in turn is going to help you start moving the set point closer to the specification. This can help you to reduce waste and rework and improve throughput. Another thing to consider besides accuracy is the rangeability or the turndown of the instrument. Turndown is something that can be difficult to interpret because there are a number of different ways to describe it. And a huge turndown ratio may not actually be all that helpful if you're only operating your flow rates at the low end of the flow meter's capabilities. So in this chart, for example, several of the meters can handle liquid up to 30 feet per second, but if your application has a maximum flow rate of 10 feet per second, the high end of the meter is unusable in your particular application. Many meters are going to publish turndown based on the meter maximum flow rate instead of your maximum application flow rate. Because DP meters are sized with beta ratios to fit the application, the turndown for them is usually defined closer to the application flow rate. The main advice here is just to consider your actual flow coverage by the meter for your application instead of just going strictly by published rangeability numbers. Coriolis meters do typically have very high rangeability, but it is dependent on the sensor design. So the Micromotion Elite meter is going to have the best turndown capabilities. Also for ultrasonic meters, um, Daniel ultrasonic meters can typically be used from about 3 to 30 feet per second for liquids and about 1 foot per second to 100 feet per second for gas applications. When rangeability is a concern for you, Emerson does offer a couple of great additional solutions. 
All vortex meters have a low flow cutoff that limits their ability to measure lower flow rates. And this is just a matter of physics. As you go to lower flow rates, you aren't going to physically create that vortex. Um, so it's common for a vortex to be smaller than the inlet and the outlet piping. The Rosemount Model 8800 vortex has a 30 to 1 turndown and it has an optional reducer. So that even extends the low flow rates more. And it essentially allows a smaller vortex to be installed very simply in the line without requiring additional straight run after the reducers in the line. And as shown as a Example for steam, the typical application ma maximums are usually quite achievable even with the reducer in place. So let's begin considering some of the installation requirements. One of the flow best practices is to minimize the amount of special piping around the flow measurement point. Flow of fluid isn't always consistent across the entire cross section of the piping because you're going to have friction along the walls and there are fluid properties that allow streamlined layers of fluids to slide over one another. So this is called laminar flow and it can be seen by the in the top flow profile here. When the fluid is intermixed and the velocity is essentially constant across the cross section of the pipe, we consider the flow to be turbulent flow. Most velocity-based flow meters, such as vortex, ultrasonic, and mag meters, as well as DP meters, like orifice and venturi meters, need to have turbulent flow for accurate measurement. In addition, as fluid flows through elbows or other flow disturbances, the profile can take on a swirl or an asymmetric profile that can also cause measurement inaccuracy. So the way to reduce the measurement inaccuracy due to like the swirl or the asymmetric flow profiles is to condition the flow using a flow conditioner, which is commonly just a bundle of small tubes to force the liquid to travel in a known path, or to use long straight runs of piping. Flow conditioners can be expensive and add additional pressure drop to the system, and long straight runs can also be expensive or they can force you to locate a meter in an awkward or potentially less safe area than you would choose if straight run wasn't a consideration. So really, anytime you can minimize straight run requirements, that's a good thing. Here's a diagram that shows you just some of the general, typical straight run requirements for different technologies. On the one end of the scale, you'll see that, like, all micromotion Coriolis meters require no flow conditioning. Traditional orifice plates are on the other end of the spectrum requiring very long straight runs. For example, per ISO 5167 standards, you're required to have a minimum of 44 diameters of straight run upstream of a single 90 degree elbow. However, you can see that there are other options like by choosing a conditioning orifice plate you can reduce that straight run requirement to just two diameters upstream and downstream of the meter. So again, just consider how much straight run you have available and how that will impact your measurement if you don't have sufficient straight run. Flow measurement best practices also include simplifying the installation for other things besides just the straight run. So as you work to simplify the installation, you can significantly reduce the number of potential leak points in the system. For example, in a traditional, typical orifice installation with long impulse lines, you can have 30 or more potential leak points, leading to environmental concerns with fugitive emissions, potential safety concerns, and energy waste. Meters such as Coriolis, MAG, and ultrasonic meters typically only have potential leak points at the inlet and the outlet. Many vortex meters have multiple potential leak points through gaskets and seals, but the Rosemount Model 8800 vortex only have potential leak points at the inlet and the outlet. And newer style orifice meters with integral transmitters also have fewer potential leak paths than your traditional meters. In fact, Rosemount makes something called a Model 9295 that's an integral conditioning orifice spool piece, so it already has the built-in straight runs. 
the transmitter, pressure and temperature, and impulse lines. And the impulse connections are welded and pressure tested at the factory for leaks, so you significantly reduce your potential leak pass. And the ports are also fully rottable to clear any plugging. So we'll talk about this solution a little later, too. Traditional impulse lines are also prone to plugging in applications with dirty fluids. So Rosemount offers direct mount technology that increases the bore size of the connection and significantly reduces the plugging. In fact, there was a three-year user study that showed that implementing this direct mount to replace impulse lines gave a 90% reduction of work orders. It also gave a 46% reduction in total maintenance costs. And so for the 3,000 applications in the study, over an entire three-year period, there were only six work orders written. The complete study is available from Rosemont if you'd like a copy of it. Integrated flow meters can also save on total installed costs versus traditional meters. So this comparison shows that in a two-inch line with class 150 flanges, you can save anywhere between 18 and 40% with integral DP meters or a vortex meter. In a six-inch line, you can save between 25 and 35% using an integrated flow meter. So typically for a larger line size, insertion type meters are going to be more cost effective, while for smaller lines, they're going to benefit from those inline devices. When you're considering the cost of ownership, it may seem obvious to think about maintenance, but it is quite often overlooked. Mechanical meters like turbine meters can have blade wear over time, leading to measurement inaccuracies and eventually to downtime depending on the fluid and the velocity of the fluid. Overspending a meter is a possibility if you have unexpected flow surges, and blade replacement can often cost almost half the price of a new meter. Magnetic and ultrasonic meters have no moving parts and the flow is typically unobstructed. Coriolis Vortex and DP meters are also an excellent choice for low maintenance since they don't have any moving parts either. In fact, if you take a look at the economics, in a 3-inch, 600-pound line, choosing a low-maintenance flow meter like MAG or Vortex can save well over 20% in the total cost of ownership. And this is just assuming that a traditional turbine would have one blade replacement. Traditionally, the total installed cost of a mass flow measurement point, so if you were looking to do mass flow for any particular point was really high because it required not only a DP meter, but pressure and temperature measurement. And then you had to tie it into a PLC or a DCS with special programming, and it took some time to do the programming to convert those measurements to a usable mass flow. So these measurement points traditionally ended up being reserved really only for those most critical flow points in a plant. Newer technologies, like Coriolis mass flow meters, make mass flow much simpler and more economically feasible. However, when most people think about Coriolis meters, they only think of the very high end, like the Micromotion Elite meters, that are ideal for custody transfer applications or custody, um, sorry, concentration measurement, control, those kinds of things. But there are a variety of different Coriolis meters with scalable features and performance specifications. The R-Series, for example, is an ideal replacement for volumetric and mechanical flow meters that will output mass flow directly at a relatively low cost. There are other newer technologies like multivariable DP meters that can also make mass flow easier and more affordable than those traditional systems. These meters have built-in pressure and temperature compensation and embedded software that can calculate mass flow. Rosemont offers the mass pro bar, which uses an averaging pitot tube for insertion into larger lines, or the mass pro plate that uses an orifice for the primary element and is ideal for those inline applications. So here's a comparison of the installed cost of a traditional DP compensated flow point and the options that we just discussed. 
As you'll see, the elite meter is about the same cost as that traditional system, while the Mass Pro Bar, Mass Pro Plate, and the R Series Coriolis meter all save more than 40% of the total installed cost for a one inch line. So now that we've talked a little bit about some of the simplified installations, let's talk about best practices for the various technologies for actually physically installing them in the line. For a vortex meter, it's important to follow the manufacturer's guidelines for straight run requirements and to mount it in such a way that the meter stays full of whatever fluid you're measuring. So if you're measuring a liquid, flow up in a vertical line or a horizontal line are the best options. If you're choosing a horizontal line, be sure to pick a point that isn't a local high point where gas bubbles could be held up in the system. In a horizontal line, it's a best practice to install the shutter bar so that it's horizontal to the ground as shown in this picture. This will allow any condensate or solid particles to pass the shutter bar. For high temperatures, the best practice is to locate the meter such that the electronics head is to the side of the pipeline. And then for temperatures above about 600 Fahrenheit or 315 Celsius, the electronics should typically be remotely mounted. Be sure to install the meter with the flow arrow pointing in the direction of the fluid flow. Coriolis meters should also be kept full if possible, although the Elite meters do have excellent two-phase flow performance. And if this is a concern for you, I would encourage you to watch one of our previous webinars that focused on the topic of multi-phase measurement. For liquids, the preferred orientation is in a vertical line, or what we call the flag position, with the flow going up, or in a horizontal line with the tubes down. For slurries, the flag position with flow up, or the horizontal position with tubes up works well. The tubes are turned up just to prevent the buildup of any solids that might fall out of the slurry. For gas applications, a vertical line with flow down or a horizontal line with the tubes up is preferred. And for any application, for Coriolis meters, you should avoid attaching anything to the case of the meter. Um, just use your standard piping supports outside of the meter on the pipeline itself and try not to hook anything up to the case. For DP meters, be sure to install the meter with the recommended minimum straight run requirements for the best performance. So for a traditional orifice meter, like I mentioned before, this could mean 44 diameters upstream and seven diameters downstream for a single elbow. And if you choose the conditioning orifice, then it would only be two up and two down. So definitely be sure though to follow those requirements. Minimize the length of the impulse line so that you can reduce your potential leak points, plugging and freezing possibilities. And then the pressure legs should be installed in an orientation to keep them full of whatever fluid you're measuring. Direct mounted transmitters are going to be the best choice. And as I mentioned before, the Rose Mount model 9295, which is shown in the middle here, is fully integrated with the required straight runs built in and fully rotable ports. It's already leak tested at the factory and has minimal leak points, so that's a good option as well. Ultrasonic meters should also be kept full. Ensure you have proper straight runs for single or bi-directional flow. Um, flow conditioners are often used upstream of ultrasonic meters, and if you are using a flow conditioner, be sure to install them as recommended. If you have gas applications, there's a lot of good guidelines from AGA 9 that you could follow. Um, ultrasonic meters should be mounted per manufacturer recommendations for orientation. If you do have improper orientation, it can cause gas or debris to collect in the transducer ports, which can cause measurement errors, but it can also cause potential equipment damage, so watch out for that. Mag meters should be kept full of liquid. Um, orientation of the electronics can be in any direction if you have vertical flow going up through the meter. But for other pipeline configurations, as shown here, the electronics head should be placed directly above or below the pipeline. Upstream and downstream straight run requirements should be followed, again, for the best performance.
Another best practice for flow is to keep pressure loss to a minimum to reduce energy costs in transferring the fluid. That is your pumping and your compressing costs. Pressure loss in a pipe is influenced not only by the fluid properties, but also by the obstruction or resistance in the path. So typically, Coriolis meters, orifice, and turbine meters are going to tend to have the highest pressure drop, while mag and ultrasonic meters have low pressure loss. However, ultrasonic meters are almost always used with flow conditioners, so don't forget to consider the pressure drop in both pieces. When a flow conditioner is used, um, the pressure loss can be comparable to a Coriolis meter in some cases, so again, just make sure you consider the whole system when you're thinking about pressure loss. And no discussion about best practices would be complete without talking about diagnostic capabilities. So diagnostics have come a long way in the past several years, and most people are no longer taking the reactive maintenance approach of waiting for the device to fail before doing anything about it. Um, the most common practice that we see in use today is more of a preventive maintenance type approach where devices are checked on a routine basis, kind of with the passage of time or generally during shutdowns or turnarounds, and serviced a bit more proactively than they were in the past. The best practice for flow measurement is to use predictive maintenance approach. So this approach uses smart diagnostics from the device or the process to predict when there might be issues and trigger maintenance events before they have a chance to shut down the process. Let's take a look at some of the diagnostic capabilities by flow technology. So each of the technologies on this slide, the Coriolis, Vortex, and Magmeter, have a meter verification option from Emerson that allow for more advanced testing of meter health and performance without removing the meter from service. Within minutes, smart meter verification can check the health of the meter and create a report for you. Coriolis meters are multivariable devices, and so the density of the fluid is often used as a really good diagnostic tool to alert you if there's any kind of coating on the tubes, if there are two phases present, or other upset conditions. In addition, there's a measurement called drive gain that's an indicator of how much energy is being used to drive the tubes. As this drive gain goes up or more energy is needed, it's a good indication that there are multiple phases present in the meter. When it's used in combination with the density, these diagnostics can detect two-phase flow and alert you right away. However, Micromission has been able to take these diagnostics to the next level with multi-phase measurement software options, such as something we call transient mist remediation for wet gas applications, and transient bubble remediation for entrained air in liquids, and then something called advanced phase measurement. These software options not only detect the presence of the two-phase flow, but then they can use algorithms to be able to correct for the multiple phases and provide a compensated output that's more representative of the true flow going through the meter. Like I mentioned, we have a webinar that focuses on this, so I've encourage you to look that up and watch that if you're interested. Using smart meter verification on a micromotion Coriolis meter will also detect if there's been any kind of damage to the flow tubes, um, typically because of something like erosion or corrosion, and would alert the user. A new feature that we have is called zero verification, and this also helps to ensure that the meter zero is captured correctly so that your measurement is the best it can be, especially for those low flow applications. The Rosemont Model 8800 Vortex flow meter has an integrated signal generator that fully verifies the functionality of the electronics and the signal processing without taking the meter out of the line. In addition, if there's any kind of issue with the sensor, it can be replaced without exposing personnel to the process fluid, draining any lines, or interrupting the flow. And with the critical process option, you can open a valve to make sure that the containment provided by the shutter bar is still intact before you replace the sensor, which adds even more protection and reduces risk. The optional integrated temperature sensor that I mentioned before for saturated steam can also be replaced without stopping the process. 
And there's a new process diagnostic called Smart Fluid Diagnostic that allows you to quickly detect and alert when the phase of the fluid changes. The Rosemount E-Series mag flow meters also have advanced diagnostics, including the ability to detect simple issues like an empty pipe, coil faults, reverse flow, and transmitter faults. In addition, this platform also includes a coil overcurrent diagnostic to ensure that it doesn't exceed the rated current of the sensor that it's connected to. And this is a really useful feature when you're taking advantage of the universal capability and using the Rosemount transmitter to drive another manufacturer's sensor. It also has something called the electrode saturation diagnostic, which is useful when the meter is installed into a cathodically protected system or electrolytic systems, where voltages present in the flow stream can cause saturation of the electrode circuitry, which results in a loss of flow measurement. This diagnostic will identify when the situation arises and provide the actionable feedback needed to rectify the situation. The ground and wiring fault detection diagnostic allows you to quickly verify that the installation is correct. There's a high process noise detection that diagnoses the cause of noisy flow measurement and provides a means to remove the variability. With the Emerson meter verification diagnostic, you can also confirm the health of the entire flow meter, the transmitter and the sensor, without any external equipment. The advanced real-time monitoring and alarm capabilities of Daniel ultrasonic meters help re reduce measurement uncertainty and improve your uptime. Daniel meter link software gives you access to information in a really visual, intuitive manner. So when your meter is equipped with the continuous flow analysis feature, you'll not only have access to more data, but actionable critical information. It's presented in an intuitive user interface that takes the complexity out of your flow measurement and empowers you to work predictively rather than reactively. At a glance, you can see if the flow profile is abnormal and see if there are any issues with any buildup or degradation of the pipe wall. It also has the option of calculating real-time speed of sound verification for your gas flows. The Rosemount DP devices have some incredible diagnostic capabilities as well, including the power advisory to ensure that the electrical loop integrity from the transmitter to the host system is good. The 3051S keeps you ahead of unwanted changing electrical loop conditions such as water in the housing, ground loop issues, or even an unstable power supply, all of which can lead to unreliable measurement or unsafe operating conditions. You can also increase plant productivity with the statistical process monitoring available in the 3051S. It basically looks at the dynamic process noise and turns that into intelligent process insight to help you uncover abnormal situations in your application. Some of the most common alerts from this information include detection of plugged in pulse lines, entrained air, cavitation, column flooding, and more. So for more information about any of these diagnostics, feel free to fill out the contact us form, or after this webinar, we'll be sending you an email and it will have links to this diagnostic information in it. And finally, even if you're using the best diagnostics in the world, they won't do you much good unless you can easily access that information. Did you know that most heart instrumentation points are underutilized? Heart devices are equipped with rich diagnostics and process information, and yet this valuable information often goes unused. Why is that? Well, many of the older legacy systems are just not equipped to receive heart communications and it's too expensive or too complicated to enable this capability through traditional wired means in a lot of cases. However, for those devices with stranded diagnostics, there's an easy and a cost-effective way to be able to, quote, see the diagnostic and process information in your devices using a simple device called the Thumb or the Heart Upgrade Module. It can be connected to existing heart devices and used to transmit the heart diagnostic or process variable information to a gateway and then integrate it into your control system. 
If you're interested in getting more information about this, there is a link on your console to find out more. So as a recap, I believe in order to get the most out of your flow measurement, you should be careful about picking the correct technology for the application and consider the various performance aspects that are most important to you. Then be sure to install the meter carefully, minimizing your straight run requirements, reducing potential leak points, and minimizing potential maintenance issues. And finally, be aware of the powerful diagnostics available and really use them. So I'd like to thank you for taking the time today to learn a bit more about flow best practices. And we'll have time for a few questions right now. Sorry, it's not a lot of time for questions. But remember, if we don't have time to get to your question, you can use our, if you submit the Q&A, we'll definitely answer those. You can also um, use the contact me form to request a follow-up visit or send me an email directly. So I'll turn it over to Allison now to facilitate the Q&A session. Thanks so much, Tanya, and thanks so much for such a great presentation and all this great information. As Tanya just mentioned, we're going to open it up now for any questions. So just as a reminder, please use the chat window to ask your questions. And it looks like, Tanya, we already got a couple in the queue, so I'll let you get going. Okay. So we got a question about please define turndown. And I apologize that I didn't mention what that was before. but. Turndown is basically from the high flow rate of the meter to the minimum flow rate that it can measure. So if you have a 30 to 1 turndown, it means that if you can measure from, for example, 30 feet per second down to 1 foot per second and still have that acceptable accuracy. So really turndown is from the maximum of the meter to the minimum where accuracy is still acceptable. If you have a large number for turndown, that means that you have more range that you can operate the meter um, accurately across. And then one of the questions that we have here is how low can you measure with DP flow meters? And so as a rule of thumb, the Rosemount DP flow meters can accurately measure flow rates with DPs as low as a tenth of an inch of water for gas, about two inches of water for steam, and one inch of water for liquid. And this is actually very impressive for DP technology. Let's see here. Um, so does smart meter verification run continuously was one of the questions. Uh, for mag meters, there is a continuous option or it can be manually initiated. So depending on whether you want it to be running all the time in the background or whether you want to run it depending on having a reason to run it like a maintenance event or whatever. The vortex meters are manually initiated, and for Coriolis meters, you can run them manually, or you can schedule them to run at whatever interval you choose. So those can be done through those different options. Um, So the question is, what types of flow instruments are best for a fluid that may result in a coating building up on the inside of the instrument over time that can potentially coat electrodes, et cetera? So really, it's going to depend on what your fluid is and how it builds up. Um, some magmeters may be a good choice for some of those applications, picking the correct liners and electrodes. Coriolis meters tend to be good for applications that have coatings because you do have the ability to detect it quite easily. And typically, a coating for a Coriolis meter is going to throw off the zero of the meter and the density of the meter, but less so the, um, the flow at higher flow rates. So you could still get a 
um, a very repeatable answer there. So another question is, when should you pull a Coriolis meter and have its calibration checked? I love that question because it's a really difficult one to answer, and it depends a lot on the application. So there are some applications that require either by law or by contract to have meter calibrations checked on certain intervals. And so those, obviously, you would follow that interval. There are ways, though, to extend the interval of the calibration, and we don't have just a one-size-fits-all calibration recommendation. I will say that over time, Coriolis meters don't have any reason for their flow calibration factor to shift. And so I have seen meters that were in a system for nine years and a pretty dirty application, bidirectional flow, that did not have to be or had not been pulled out of the line at all to be checked, and they were sent back to the factory after nine years and had the exact same um, flow calibration factor as when they had had it before. But I would say that your calibration checks are going to depend on things like whether it's an EPA-type meter, and then some of the EPA applications actually accept smart meter verification as opposed to calibration, or whether you have safety reasons that you have to check it, um, like proof testing and that sort of thing. Um, so it's going to vary a lot depending on the application, but we can definitely talk to you about your specific application and give you recommendations. Uh, says, Let's see here. If a new analog input card needs to be added, can the wireless technology eliminate the need for additional analog input points at the control system to accept the signal wiring from the devices? And so the answer for that is yes. So you can integrate your um, wireless devices will go to the gateway and then the gateway, you can use Ethernet to go into your control system, and you can eliminate those analog input cards. So I think, just out of respect for time, we still have a few more questions. I will get back in touch with anybody who left a question, but I do want to say thank you so much for joining us, and we will follow up with all the rest of the questions. Like Tanya just said, everyone, if you have any additional questions or we haven't followed up, please don't hesitate to contact Tanya directly, and she will follow up with everybody that has an unanswered question. Again, thank you for joining us today. We will be sending out a recording, a link to the recording, excuse me, uh, in an email along with uh, links to the additional resources tomorrow. And on behalf of our guests, Tanya White, as well as everyone at Emerson Micromotion and Emerson Flow Solutions, we thank you for joining us and taking the time to view the presentation. Thank you, and have a great day.